morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who do not know, and of course you probably see my name right there, but uh, I am Jamie Litchfield, and I was born and raised down in Gainesville, Florida. And uh, my wife and I moved here just uh, back in July, promptly got COVID, and uh, had to kind of isolate for a little while. But what I do, for, now I'm on, yeah, I can hear myself now. There you go. So uh, I am a, a chaplain. Um, I worked as a pastor for 15 years, as a teacher for 10 years, and now as a chaplain for about 11, 12 years now. And I work with uh, a very large company, but I'm the only person in that company in the whole state of New Mexico. And it's called a medicist, like a medical system, all strung together, a medicist. And I work in the bereavement care department to help people to, as we, they journey through their grief. I have found as I have worked with people, um, the closer you get to the end, the simpler the message needs to be. And I think we're close to the end. And that message needs to be pretty simple. And in its simplest terms, God is love. My favorite name for God is Emmanuel. God is with us. And he is with us, all of us. We're going to take a look at that. But before we do, let's have a word of prayer. Oh, and before we do, I need the clicker. Oh, I can't pray without the clicker. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Frank. I have been getting to know some of you here, so not everybody doesn't know who I am. Not everybody doesn't know. I'm not sure if that sentence works, but anyway, <laughs> let's pray. Lord, we just call upon you right now for this, your servant is a sinner just like everybody else and he needs you and we all need you we thank you that you are present with us here already before we arrived you were here after we go you still be here and even though we go you will not leave us thank you for that blessed and holy name Emmanuel to remind us that you indeed are with us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, I come from a, uh, oh, before I do that, uh, this is just for Peter. This is, you know, he always likes to tell a joke, and I just want one little joke, and that is, why did they bury the white man up on the hill? Because he's dead. That's a Peter joke. I actually changed it because uh, it actually says, why did they bury the Indian on the hill? But I didn't want to offend anybody. It's very important. Not offending. Part of loving people. So, I'm not offended. <sighs> Never mind. We'll go on. Anyway, I'll come, let's see, yeah, there we go. Woo! I was born into a, a loving family, you know? Uh, very, very good parents, stayed together. 53 years, they were married until my dad passed away about 12 years ago. And so, uh, I really am grateful. I have to say, though, when I was uh, going through my teenage years, I, <laughs> I didn't think that my parents were so wise, and I got into arguments with them quite often. And uh, Mark Twain, he, has a, he made a statement, you know, when I was 14, <sighs> my dad was the stupidest man on the planet. He, every, every word that came out of his mouth just seemed so stupid. 
But you know, when I was 21, I found out that my dad was one of the wisest men on the planet. He learned a lot in those seven years. <laughs> I have to say that whenever the arguments were flying and the voices were raised, not one time did I ever doubt their love for me. Not many people can say that. I always knew I was loved. Now, we had a, a rule in the house, you know, there was no shouting unless there was a fire. And as I recall, there were a lot of fires. <laughs> so, what, but in the midst of all that, I never doubted their love. Like I said, not everybody could say that. I assumed that I am loved. I always assume that. No matter what is said, I assume that. But I have learned that that's not the case for most people. I want you to assume this above all else because the family that I really have, am a part of, that, have, that I came from, is from my Heavenly Father. Before my mother and father, my Heavenly Father, my earthly parents, my Heavenly Father knew who Jamie Litchfield was and is. In fact, all the way back to Adam. And before Adam, we were in Christ because he made it so. And he always loves. You know, not every time that my parents opened their mouth did I expect always to have goodness and kindness. Most of the time, but not all the time. But with Christ, you can count on it. Amen. He cares for you. Now, this is a depiction, an artist's depiction of God, God the Father, and uh, we see it, and there's, to a large degree, it is an accurate depiction. I mean, it's as much as we can make out. But let me ask you this. How would you describe God? How would you describe God? Hmm. God is love. It's the way John describes him. God is love. Now, as God is love, and he always loves. From beginning to end, he is love, all the way through. Now, that love is not as we really truly know it. I'm going to go into some things here, and I, I have to apologize ahead of time because I don't know, what time am I supposed to finish? One o'clock? I'm sorry? One. Thank you. <laughs> That's what I always wanted, Frank, is a yes man. <laughs> so, but, oh, what I wanted to say is that we're part of this family right here. And you see those angels up there? Now, we don't know how many, truly, how many angels there are. But as, I do know this, that they love us too. Because they're children of the Father, and they haven't been tainted by sin. And they love us. And you know what? Every angel in heaven, every angel that's right here in this room, was willing to lay down their life for us. That's how much they, were, they love us. They were willing to do it. But Christ himself laid down his life. And he did it so that we who do not deserve it one little bit, can be a part of his family. Amen. To be a part of that love and joy and peace throughout eternity. And right now we're going through a mess. We've been going through it. We're not always perfect. Wait a second, let me back that. I'm almost always not perfect. I'm perfectly imperfect. All right, so... Um, Let's go. Emmanuel. 
God with us, what the season. I love this. Look at this. I mean, I don't know who did this, but such a great job. It fits the building just perfectly, and everything about it just is, brings joy to my heart. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And I also, I did want to say, too, my wife and I love this church and love the, the people in it. The ones that we have met have all, all been great. And the ones if you haven't, that we haven't met, well, I hope you are, too. <laughs> you are. I know. You're awesome. All right. So uh, for the greatest text for Christmas is this one right here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's it right there. That's the greatest Christian, I mean Christmas, now I'm going Christian instead of Christmas. But that's the greatest Christmas text there is in my book. For God so loved the world that he gave his only, say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the family that God wants you to have or to be a part of. Now, what I was going to apologize for earlier is that I put together this, this slide presentation. I spent so much time pulling the slides together that I didn't have enough time to, to pull them apart. <sighs> So there's a lot of slides in here that are my babies, and I didn't want to get rid of them. And now you're going to have to wade through them up until 1 o'clock. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Hopefully. All right. So, yeah, for God so loved the world. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to do here, I think this takes me back, is I want to say, yes, God so loved the world, but did he love the world only? Does he love the world only? He is the God of the universe and he loves the, every being in this universe. And what a universe we have. We start off with this world, but this world is just tiny. Got the moon there. Is God there? Is God there in these clusters of gases where they say stars are being formed or in this galaxy? You know, in the universe, they, some suggest that the universe is kind of egg-shaped, sort of, and it's huge. And if, if the universe were shrunk down and filled up this auditorium right here, you would find our little section kind of off and over to the left. And in that little section there, as you got closer to it, you would find a little pinprick if it was the size of this. But this little pinprick in that little area over there is a cluster, a cluster not of, of planets, not of stars, but of galaxies. A little pinprick. And so you expand that out, these galaxies, and you see these little, these little uh, other clusters, and you'll find one cluster of which the Milky Way is a part. And even when you see that cluster, it's a pinprick. And you expand that on out. And of course, the Milky Way galaxy, where is ours? It's way out on the edge. It's not even in the inner city. It's way out there in the boondocks. And you go over to there, which is a pinprick, and you see the, the uh, heliosphere, which our sun is a part of. And when you look at the center of the heliosphere, the sun itself is a pinprick. You have to get mighty close to see our earth. And all of this, he holds together Amen. with his love. He is before all things, and in all things, in him, <clears throat> all things hold together. If Christ was not, nothing would be. Everything that was created was created by him and through him. 
and he holds it together even today. And I say that it's his love that holds it together. He's holding it together for me and you so that we can be a part of him and with him. His love. We're in good hands. Yes. Oops. Oh, let me go to this. If you got your Bibles, turn to 107, Psalm 107. It's in the middle of the Bible. It's pretty almost the dead center of the Bible. I think Psalm 108 is the center, I believe. I can't remember for sure. Didn't look it up. But um, Psalm 107, look at this. The very first part of Psalm 107. This is a neat psalm. I mean, it's one of the, my favorites. It says, Psalm 107, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Can I have an amen? amen. For his loving kindness is everlasting. Amen. His love is is unfailing. His mercies go on forever. You see various translations there. His unfailing love endures forever. Isn't that marvelous? And then it says, and let the redeemed say so. <laughs> I heard this one preacher say, when he saw this, he says, so! <laughs> Let the redeemed say so. <laughs> oh, isn't it beautiful? Just tell the world about his unfailing love. Now, let's go on down. It tells about various different groups of people that should tell about his love. But for me, the one that stood out the most starts in verse 17. And it says, fools. Because of their rebellious way and because of their iniquities were afflicted. Their soul abhorred all kinds of food and they drew near to the gates of death and they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And what happened? He saved them. Fools he saved. And you're looking at one of them. Praise the Lord. He saves fools. Praise the Lord. He saves fools. He loves even fools. And he loves me. Look at here. They cried to him, out, cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. And he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Let them, who? Fools. Let the fools give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness for he, and for his wonders to the sons of men. Let them offer, thank, offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his works with joyful singing. Hallelujah. We're going to sing a little bit later. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Yeah, let's sing it out. I don't want to call anybody a fool. Jesus says that we shouldn't do that. But we can call ourselves fools for in every way that we have gone away from the Lord, in every way that we have turned away from his word, in every way, because he's told us over and over again, and it's just foolish for us to go that way. But as we turn back to him, he loves us, and he redeems us. Praise his holy name. Let the redeemed of the Lord say, So! For he loves us. Yes. I have loved you, he says, with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. I have said these words over and over and over and over again only to see the tears flow down. I'll never forget the one lady that I came to see. She was on her deathbed. She was a sixth, fifth and sixth grade teacher for 40 years. A lovely Catholic lady. But she got a stroke. 
Her right side was paralyzed. Her left side was hurting. And I tried to get in there over and over again, but they didn't let me. But I'm persistent. I'm just kind of tenacious that way. And finally, the family called and said, hey, would you come on over? So I did. And when I got there, I came to the Catholic lady, knowing she's Catholic and knowing the way many Catholics have high respect for priests. And so when I came in, I said, I am the chaplain, and I have a word of the Lord for you. Are you ready? And she nodded, and I said, God loves you. And she cried, and she cried, and cried, and cried. Five solid being there for five solid minutes and seeing someone crying like that. I mean, bawling. And then she straightened to, oh, her daughter started bawling. Her son-in-law started bawling. And I was trying to hold it back. But finally, she just stopped and said, I'm ready to get up. They had to bring the Hoyer lift over, lift her up out of the bed, bring her over into the living room, or into the uh, wheelchair, wheeled her into the living room, and we had a lovely visit together. She could only talk, oh, left side, only talk out of the left side of her mouth, but we uh, were able to talk, and that was the last good visit the family had with her before she died. The love of the Lord, the reason I want to give this message today is that, first of all, It's the truth. Second of all, don't you know that it's the kindness and goodness of God that brings people to repentance? It's not fear. Fear does some, yes. And I mean, there's an element there that, yes, we need to come before God. And when we do and we see him as he is, it does bring fear to our hearts. But as we realize that he is an awesome God, the ruler of the universe, and yet he loves me and you as his own children and is willing to die for me and you, as we see that love and we realize how we have rejected it so many times over and over again, have slighted it, have moved away from it, have given up great opportunities to share it, it draws us to repentance. And saying, Lord, forgive me and help me to be more like you. And I contend with you today, or that is, I want to suggest to you that wherever God is, his love is. And wherever his love is, his grace abounds. Wherever God is, his love is. And wherever his love is, his grace abounds. From here to the ends of the universe... Now, some of you have heard of multiverses. I'm not going to argue against it at all. But I will say that my God is big enough to inhabit multiverses. And wherever my God is, his love is. For he is love. All right, so... Where is God's love, or where is God not to be found? Where is he not? Can we find a place where God is not at? Well, we can argue some things here or there. But one thing for sure, wherever he is, his love is. Is he at the cemetery or mass graves? Whether you're Christian or Jewish or Muslim or what about the neonatal unit or the pediatric oncology? I've been there. I heard a three-year-old tell her mother who was crying and said, but what do I do? And the three-year-olds came out with these words. But we have each other now, Mom. We have each other now. She died, three years old, brain cancer. It's pitiful. 
Is God there? And here's Caitlin Nelson. She documented from her 14th year when she found out she had cancer. Is God there? God was there with her. She died just well prior to her 16th birthday. And of course, in her faith, she believed that she went right straight to be with Jesus. She put together that picture. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. And I will restore you, O virgin Israel. There's kind of a couple of different ways to understand that. Is that they were perfect, but when was Israel ever perfect? Another way to understand is that they're young. And he was looking them, at them as his young children. And he's saying, and I will restore you, O virgin Israel. And you will be restored. I love how he puts it two back to back. I have, you will be restored. I will restore you. And you will be restored. If you don't believe it, I'm saying it to you for a second time. And, and in, the, in the Hebrew, it's got the perfect and imperfect tense. The imperfect is for future. This does not use the imperfect tense. It uses the perfect tense. As in, I know it's not done yet, but because I'm saying it, and I'm God, it is as if it has already been done. In other words, and I have restored you, future tense. You get what I'm saying? Because God said it, it's as if it is done even though we haven't seen it yet. We can count on it, like the floor underneath our feet, the ground on which we walk. It is as sure as the ground upon we, which we walk. Yes. You know, I've seen these trust falls where people, you know, catch me, can we trust you? Oh yeah, we can trust God. I can trust him more than I can trust this stage. I know because he has said it, he will do it. And you will be restored and you will pick up the tambourine and go out dancing with the joyful. As a young Adventist, I was taught not to dance. So I don't know if we'll have a little special section for Seventh-day Adventists, you know. <laughs> they, they don't dance, but... I think I'm going to dance. I, mean, I think I might just be influenced by all those other people that are dancing before the Lord and the joy of the Lord. Yes, sir. And wherever God is, his love is. And wherever his love is, his grace abounds. He's calling you and he wants you. He says, have you been a fool? Call out to me. I want you to be a part of my family. Where every word is a kind word. Every deed is a deed of kindness. And the care that is given and the joy that you will experience. I want you to have it. This whole world. I can't even remember why I put that one in there. But, it's, <laughs> but he is found there. It's, can you go down to the depths of the ocean and find God? Yes, you can. Oh, it's wonderful how they thought nothing lived way down there below. But stuff does live down there, all the way down to the bottom of the Mariana Trench, seven miles deep, man. The Mount Everest can sit there and have two miles above it. It's amazing. What about in the darkness? Not just darkness, but a life of darkness and depression, where people go into the depths of depression. If someone is in the depths of depression, they're probably not sitting here. Probably at home. Maybe watching this. Maybe not. Because depression sets in. And my tendency, of course, my tendency is when I deal with people with depression, my first question when someone asked me one time is this, what do you do when you get depressed? I don't get depressed. What do you do when you get discouraged? <laughs> I just keep going. But a lot of people are not that way. See, I come from a family that's different in the sense that I never doubted ever my, that their love for me was there. 
praise God for that, but I realize I'm a unique specimen. There's a lot of people out there that go through depression, and my, I taught third, I taught, I taught fifth grade girls one year, fifth, fifth, and there was boys there too, but the girls is what I learned from, I learned from them, and I learned that fifth grade girls can have their best friend in the morning turn into their worst enemy that afternoon. And my most common statement to the girls that year was, get over it. And that's my statement. That's the way I feel about people that have depression a lot of times. I'm saying that because I learned that you just don't get over it. It seeps in. It hangs there. And you wonder, does God exist? You have thoughts of saying, I don't want to be here anymore. I want to leave this world, this life, everything. Is God there? I know he is. He's there. He's there for you. Job's friends came around and they were talking to him, or that is, they started talking. They didn't really lose it until they opened their mouth. They could have been the dumbest fools ever, but they didn't. If they just kept their mouth shut, they would thought they would have been thought of as wise, because Job later says, "If only you would be altogether silent for you, that would be wisdom." Lord, hush my mouth. Sometimes we need to just listen. Nothing more. Not a peep. Maybe clarification, but nothing more. Not even to say, I know that God is with you. Because they the friends, those good friends, those friends who sat there for seven days and didn't open their mouth, when they finally did open their mouth, they revealed their ignorance and their foolishness. That's hard for me, but I've learned that I, I do much more to help people with my ears than I do with my mouth. This is my time to speak. Most of the time, because of the nature of my work, it is right here. Ask key questions and sit back. Listen. You do more to lift people up by hearing what they have to say. Than them, by then telling them what you think they need to know. There is light. Maybe we can be that light, holding that star. I love that. I was, I was wanting five as well. <laughs> but hold that light up quietly. Like she said, I just love the illustration. The star, it was just there. It didn't shout out. It didn't say, follow me. It was just there. We too can be there. The best, I'm sorry, I'm going all over the place, man. I'm sorry, but I love you. Probably the three most important words in the English language. But sometimes, a lot of times, people don't believe you. And they have good reason to not believe. They've been maligned and Betrayed so many times by people who've told them that they love you, that they love them. There's three more words, and every bit is important. And they testify that love is there. I am here. I am here. Nothing more. This dear lady lost her husband. And I was there with her in the hospital. Very sudden. He was sitting on the couch or the sofa and um, I mean, uh, the lazy boy, whatever. And he, he just went out. She saw him. That was it. No more. Had all kinds of plans, all kinds of things to do. Nothing. No more. Of course, ambulance came, took him to the hospital, And I was there with her, with her best friend and her son. 
And she starts on in many statements asking questions of God, asking questions about the health people, and asking questions, big questions, hard questions. I never saw anything like it before or since. Three of us sitting there, not saying one word, not trying to answer her questions, just quiet. And then she finally said to her best friend, I guess you're going on your cruise next week. <laughs> and her best friend, that's finally when someone said something to all. She said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm here with you. And that's what God is saying to us. I am here. God is with us. He loves us, but he demonstrates it by being here. Sometimes he don't feel like he's here. Sometimes he seems very far away. And for those of you who are going through depression, I want to remind you as a speaker today that he is near. He is with you. He sees you all the way to the depths of your darkness, and he is there. He wants you to know that he loves you. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I love what he says after that, too. He says, for I will strengthen you. You know, if I think you can make it, I will strengthen you so that you can have the strength to do it. But I'm going to do more than that. If you don't have the strength, even if I strengthen you, if you can't do it, I'm going to help you to do it. I'm going to help you through it. And beyond that, yea, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. He will do it for you if you cannot on your own. We got a lot of diseases in this world, lots of crazy stuff. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. That's the reason we can do it. Right there at the cross. Was, Jesus, was God there? God was there. Reconciling the world to himself. He was there in Christ. And these words, Father, forgive them. That's, that tells us that the Father was right there. He was listening. He, when the worst sin or atrocity that was ever committed by mankind was happening, God was there. And where sin is, grace doth much more abound. Where sin is more, is more I'm, I'm messing up the statement, but nevertheless, where sin abounds, grace doth much more abound. Finally came out. Wherever God is, his love is, and wherever his love is, his grace does abound. Is he with the old and the young? Oh, yeah. Nice pictures coming up here. Different religions, is he there? Does he love them is a better way of saying it. Yes, he does. He loves them. I tell you, I've been with all kinds of religions, from atheists to <laughs> some kind of backyard religions. I know this, that God still loves them. He wants them. He is calling out to them, and he calls out the same, in the same words to all of us, I love you, and I'm here. Well, how the world did that thing get in there? Anyway, uh, it is the darkness of misapprehension of God that is enshrouding the world. Men are losing, men and women, are losing their knowledge of his character. It has been misunderstood and misrepresented, just like misinterpreted, just like I have, I shared a backyard religions. Uh, this is especially so in Georgia and Florida where I'm from. I don't know about New Mexico yet, but I found some pretty uh, strange statements. You know, the Bible says this, that, and the other, and I've never read that before. And I'll even say, I'll say, well, you know, I've never read that. <laughs> 
but it's been misunderstood and misinterpreted. His character is to be made known into the darkness. His character is to be made known into the darkness of the world, is to be shed the light of his goodness, mercy, and truth. Now here's the key statement, the heart of the whole message, basically. The last rays of merciful light, the message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. I thought it was the mark of the beast. I thought it was the three angels' message. I thought it was a lot of stuff. But this is what it is. And yes, if, I love to say this part here, if your understanding of the mark of the beast doesn't make you a more loving Christian brother and sister, then there's something wrong with your understanding of the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is a warning for our brothers and sisters who live all around us. A warning to us ourselves, come out of Babylon. Come out of Babylon. I love you, I'm calling you out of Babylon. Be a part of my family. Yes, you got that. Yeah, I got some nice pictures here. Is God there? You better believe it. I mean, in the cold? (laughs) I'm from Florida. I am so happy for the cold. Thank you. In the deep depths of the jungle? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Beautiful. Uh, What gods do they serve? What gods do they call out to? I know this. Whatever God it is that they're calling out to, there's a God, my God, who says, I love you and I want you. Now, check this out. This is something here. Now, I hope it doesn't go beyond that. Yeah, it just flew on right by. But those are hands. Is God there? Some kind of fungus. How ugly that is. That's a result of sin somehow, somehow, and probably not his or her sin. But we are just as ugly. This is us we're looking at because we are part of humanity. This is our brother and sister. We saw two of them there. The brother. Sin. It makes us ugly. But wherever God is, his love is. And wherever his love is, his grace does abound. Ooh, isn't that, boy, doesn't that just draw you in? With the old and the young, the rich, what a place. A yacht with a boat, with the poor, the really poor. Desperately poor. Is God with them? Very famous picture there. Wherever God is, his love is. Sometimes we wonder, is his love there? I tell you, you know, when you see your own child dying, when you're laying in bed and your every breath is tough, Is God there? Oh, just one second here. What emotions come up when you see these next two pictures? Sorry, I I jumped ahead of myself, but it's a picture. Do these men inspire love in your heart? It's your first thought, oh, I love this person. This is kind of a testimony to what's happening in our world right now. The tribalism of, of, of politics today is terrible. And I have a whole other message 
that has to do with what happened in Rwanda can happen here. Seventh-day Adventists killing each other because they were a part of a different tribe has no place in Christianity. And if this man right here brings hatred in your heart, you need to examine your heart and call out to the Lord. Same with the other one, too. Wherever God is, his love is. His love. And his love is to flow through us. And wherever his love is, his grace abounds. There's grace for those two men and everyone that is following. Millions. It's amazing to me what's happening in our world. So I bring you back to a beach. <laughs> is God love there? Is God there? Is his love there? I've been to a place very similar to that. I don't know where that one is. And uh, beautiful. Isn't that beautiful? It's nature really uh, brought my heart to the Lord when I first came to him. Awesome. Wherever God is, his love is, and his grace abounds there. Yes, it does. Even in the storms, you know, uh, God's love is there, man. The destruction that Pakistan just went through a major floods. I want you to notice the difference between this one and this one. Do you see that? Mouths are open, the teeth are showing. But one is terrible, terrible, traumatic grief. And the other is joy. Is God there at both? Wherever his love is. Oh. Oh, yeah. This vegetarian loves this. Oh, yeah. Mmm. Oh, oh, what's this fish doing in there? Mm-mm. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh. Watch out now. Is God there with the people that are eating turkey? Mm. Oh. Watch out now. I bet this guy is praising his gods. He's got a meal for his family for a while. I'm not, never mind, we'll go on. Wherever God's love is, his grace abounds. And he is everywhere. Now I'm not suggesting, oh Lord, yeah, I'm going to go on here, yeah. Is he in the kitchen? Is he in the bedroom? Oh, I skipped one. He's in the bathroom? He's there. He knows. Oh, I love this one. Is he there? Oh, look at this wedding. A total different culture from ours. Oh, look at the beautiful people there and the joy and the love that is being celebrated. Is God there? Yes, he is. He's, he's, he invented marriage. What about here? You feel uncomfortable maybe? And I'm just going to take a, a moment here. You know, the statistics are showing that more and more people are saying that they are gay or lesbian or, or bi or transgender, uh, gender dysphoria. No, this is more and more of it. More and more. You know, back at the generation of our fathers and grandfathers, they were about... 0.2% would identify themselves as gay. Now, perhaps they were afraid to do so, you know, because in some places it's still major league against the law. You could be jailed. But as time went on, it, it's risen up to about 2%, or, and it's rising up even more and more. And they say that if it keeps on going like it is right now, up around, around 2100, we'll, we'll all be gay. I kind of say that in jest. But that's just the way the trends are going right now. Does this make you uncomfortable? Does God love these people? 
in a congregation like this, there may be someone here all that does identify. Or you know someone close to you that identifies as being gay or lesbian or et cetera, et cetera. What does your heart say? God loves them. This is where this place right here, for many, is very difficult. I know that probably people that are watching right now or maybe right here is very prone for misunderstanding. But God loves the sinner and he hates the sin. God loves the sinner, but he hates my sin. This is where I come back to. God is with us. He may not be for us in certain circumstances, but he is with us. My brother one day decided to stay out all night long with his girlfriend, and he was only 17, and got high, drunk, and all kinds of other stuff, and who knows what. But we were worried because back those days, we didn't have the cell phone, you know, so he didn't call us, didn't let us know where he was at, and we were all worried, looking all over for him. Finally, we found him, showed up at the house. And then, because he received a little bit of grief when he got home, he decided that he was going to leave again. And I said, okay. No, first I said no, 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 no. But he's gone, and he's a big old boy. And I said, well, I'm going with you. He jumped the fence, and I jumped it with him. He jumped back over the fence, I jumped back over with him. He jumped back over the fence again, and I jumped with him. And he says, why are you doing this? And I said, because I love you. With that, we went back inside, and he got some sleep. <laughs> God may not be for you, but he is with you. Us. This is us as hum human beings. Us as families. You know this. Those of you who know someone close, that have identified and you struggle with, what do I say? Do I accept this fully and completely? That's between you and God right now. I'm not going to give you a whole lot of answers on this, but right now I will say it. God is with us and he's with us, all of us. He's with us, but he may not be for us in every aspect of our lives. In the darkness of misapprehension, God is that of God that is enshrouding the world, men are losing their knowledge of his character. It has been misunderstood and misinterpreted. His character is to be made known. Into the darkness of the world is to be shed the light of his goodness and mercy. The last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is the revelation of his character of love. For all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And for while we were yet helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more so, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. There's a lot to unpack there, but I don't have time. All men are of one family by creation. Of course, when Ellen White wrote this, she, that was the term, you know, now we know that all people are of one family by creation, and all are one through redemption. Christ's love is so broad, so deep, so full, that it penetrates everywhere. It lifts out of Satan's circle, the poor souls that have been deluded by his deceptions. Praise God. It's his love that reaches that deep, no matter how deep it is. He can reach there. 
It places them within the reach of the throne of God, the throne encircled by the rainbow of his promise. When we seek the appropriate language in which to describe the love of God, we find words too tame, too weak, too far beneath the theme, and we lay down our pen and say, no, it cannot be described. We can only do as did the beloved disciple and say, behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Let the redeemed of the Lord say, So, yes, in attempting any description of this love, we feel that we are as infants lisping our first words. Silently we may adore, for silence in this matter is the only eloquence. This love is past all language to describe. All the paternal love which has come down from generation to generation through the channel of human hearts, all the springs of tenderness which have opened in the souls of men are but a tiny reel to the boundless ocean when compared with the infinite, exhaustless love of God. Tongue cannot utter it, pen cannot portray it. You may meditate upon it every day day of your life. You may search the scriptures diligently in order to understand it. You may summon every power and capability that God has given you in the endeavor to comprehend the love and compassion of the Heavenly Father. And yet, there is an infinity beyond. In fact, the holy angels endeavor to understand it. They dig deep into it, and they still cannot. We will go through eternity exploring finding more meaning through it and about it. You may study that love for ages, yet you can never fully comprehend the length and the breadth, the depth and height of the love of God in giving his son to die for the world. Eternity itself can never fully reveal it. Yet as we study the Bible and meditate on the life of Christ and the plan of redemption, these great themes will open to our understanding more and more. What I love is that even a three-year-old, a three-year-old can grasp it. Oh, the love of God. He's calling. He wants us. He died for us. Father, forgive them. Is his love here? He comes. Is his love here? So I made a fire come out from you, and it consumed you, and it reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who were were watching. Wherever God is, his love is, and his love sometimes, even in that grace, will put an end to suffering. The human heart is most deceitful. Who who really knows how bad it is? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Jesus is calling for you to be a part of a family that expresses love every day. I want you to know about this love. Sing with me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Stop right there. Stop. Do you really know this? Do you assume this? I want you to know it. 
to the depths of your heart and being. When your life is ebbing away and every breath is labored and there's pain for every movement, I want you to know God loves you. When you see your child laying there lifeless, no more breath, cold, dead, I want you to know that God loves you. When the whole world seems to be against you and God himself seems to have turned away from you, I want you to know that's a lie of the devil because he is there. He was with his own son at the cross when the worst sin ever committed upon the planet in which we live, ever, he was there and he loves you and he wants you. He's calling for you. How do we know? Because the Bible says so. And I can tell you this, I know, because it's in my heart. And I want you to know it to the depths of your being. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you see each one here. You know everyone and their needs and the needs of their family and their friends. You know the needs of this world. And as we come closer to the end, Lord, help us to be like that star shining in the night, shining and sharing about your great love, not only for us, but for every single being upon this planet. Help us to be drawing them to you through your love. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.